so my name is Johanna Collin, and I'm a writer and I'm a game designer. I'm also a radio and, and TV presenter and producer and a media industry analyst, which is the hat I will be wearing here today. Um, what we do in the Nostradamus project is we figure out the future, the next three to five years of the, of the screen industries, as we like to say. We mostly focus on film and television. And the way that we do that is that we cheat. We ask the people who are in their day-to-day -day work already creating the future. So as you know, especially with, with, with film, it takes such a long time to make a film that whatever strategic decisions or production decisions are being made today are in actual fact shaping the market three to five years. From from now. So basically, we just ask those people what they're doing and thinking, and then we figure out what's already happening. Um, and the future makers then would be anybody who is trying a new thing. The people who are doing the thing they've always been doing are not as interesting for our needs. Every year we re uh, release a report. Those are available free on our website. You can download them all on nostradamusproject.org. Uh, and uh, we also have an international seminar once a year at the, at the film market at the Gothenburg Film Festival where we talk about our latest findings. And these reports are quite short. They're around 20 pages. Uh, you're me meant to be able to read them in one hour. They're digested analysis of, of the kinds of big reports that are already out there, but that obviously you don't have time to read because your creative's working in a very demanding industry. So this is really the cheat sheet to help you start thinking about the stuff that you need in the future. And we cover very important trends in the industry and all of the buzzword stuff that you might want. That's all in the reports. That's not what I'm going to be doing today. I'm going to look back on the reports we've done in our first three years and try and sort of do some kind of top-level meta-analysis of the changes that we're in. So basically, exactly what, what Peter has been talking about for the previous hour, I'm going, he talk, he's talked about what's happened. I'm going to talk about what does it mean that it has happened, and what does it mean for, for how we're going to take that onwards. So I will posit today that we have gone through a very dramatic and traumatic change, the oh situation in the film industries. So the good news is that it's over. The worst has already happened. Um, and so we can imagine that there's been an earthquake and the pieces haven't settled, a lot of things are still in the air, but at least the, word, the worst is over and there might be some after tremors and there's still some new things that need to happen and, and a lot of our infrastructure has been broken in this earthquake, so we have an opportunity to ask ourselves whether some, of, some, some things could be better than, than the way we organized it before. Um, but my message of hope is that we have that this is we have to sort of dust brush the dust off and and stand up straight we have to stop cowering um in fear this is the post apocalyptic world uh, this thing has happened what did it mean what should we do next and i think to begin answering that question we have to ask first where did our when did our troubles begin and i think a lot of the time when we, th when we talk about this, these are the kinds of answers that pop up in your mind uh, immediately. You're like, well, it's piracy. That was when our problems began. Or it's YouTube, or it's subscription video services. That's when our troubles, uh, troubles began. And, and certainly these are some of the ogres that are uh, immediately threatening film viewing culture or have in fact already changed. This again, this has happened. It's nothing we can fight. We, it has already changed film viewing culture and therefore filmmaking as we know it. But these services didn't create the underlying urges. These services were a response to a need of the audience in combination with new, with new possibilities made because of technology, but, but in response to something that people wanted. There has been a ton of services that didn't have this impact, and that's because nobody needed it. This is things that people have felt that they need. Binge watching wasn't invented by Netflix. Binge watching came to us with VHS boxes. I don't know if you've ever purchased a VHS box of a TV series. I have bought many of those. Broadcast marathons. Uh, I mean, you could, there were binge screenings of TV shows at night on traditional networks in the Nordic countries when I was young in the 80s and 90s. And of course, early cinema in itself was a binge-watching experience. Quite typically, you would buy a ticket and then you could go into the movie theater and just keep watching uh, until you wanted to go home. Piracy, of course, is as, as old as copyright, and YouTube technically is, is just people talking to people without constraints on geography or time. 
And in the next few slides, I'm going to uh, quote the 2014 Nostradamus report because it condensed 20,000 years of cultural history in only a few sentences, and that was such a that was very hard work to write those paragraphs. So I'm just not going to do it again. Uh, this is what we wrote in 2014: Film and broadcast television represent a top-down mode of culture that is rapidly self-correcting back to the original order of things. The original order of things that was not top-down culture. The original order of things where humans produced cultural artifacts for their own communities. So the historical situation was that people created culture for the people that were physically in the same place as them, but then we got sort of long-distance media and eventually also mass media two or three centuries ago. And when mass media was introduced, it was introduced at a historical moment when, when our societies were strongly hierarchical, and this development coincided and collaborated ideologically with many others other changes that were happening in our societies at the same time. So mass media is introduced in collaboration, in collaboration with and in collusion with the nation state, capitalism, and the prof professionalization of the arts. Historically, being, being a creative, an artist, was not a job. But there's a point in history, in fact enabled in, to a great degree by capitalism, when it becomes possible to have the jobs that all of, all of us have, or their earlier equivalents. And these concepts, all of these concepts, have been incredibly successful, not just for the arts, but I mean, they have created society as we know it. We are very grateful in many ways, I think, to, to have lived under nation state and, the capital, and capitalism, and certainly to live in an era when it's possible to live professionally as an artist. And in combination, these things have given us things that have been incredibly useful for us, like copyright legislation, which, when you think about it, is an effect of all three at the same time. But these things are not inevitable. This is something that first didn't exist, and then they did exist. And we live now in, in a time when all of these things are again being challenged. We're moving towards a situation where these may, in fact, not exist again. The nation state is already, under, is already challenged by globalization, which is an effect of capitalism. It turns out, in the end, capitalization can, will trump, no pun intended, <laughs> the nation state. So a lot of the problems that the film industry is facing, copyright infringement, for instance, and globalization, and amateur content and semi-professional distribution systems are connected to much, much wider changes in society, these things uh, being in movement and in flux. So then we wrote, the democratization of mass media that has happened in the last de decades is correcting this historical blip. Th there was a time when, not all, when, when people ne needed to create culture in this top-down structure. That was a historical blip, and now it's over. Media content and other kinds of culture are increasingly produced by many for many. And at the same time, the distribution of top-down content is inc increasingly globalized. And the democratization of the mass media, that's not just the internet. This has been going on, again, since at least the 1980s. We got home electronics for, that changed music and film production. We got video that changed filmmaking and created home entertainment. Uh, we got community television also, as I said, like local TV. That was a side effect of video, for instance. And even things like desktop publishing that we now take for granted, laser co copying machines at the offices, Xerox. These were all em enormous communications revolutions that were, are about democratization of mass media. So, to some degree, it looks like what's happening now is that folk culture is being recreated, but I think that's, that's an error of perspective. Folk culture has been going on uh, in parallel to popular culture the whole time. So, popular culture is produced by professionals for the masses. Folk culture is produced by the masses for the masses. Amateur culture has been there all the time. Folk music has been played, bands, people have played in bands, theater clubs have been happened and for amateurs, and, and people have been knitting, and, and fanzines you know, were invented in, in the 60s, uh, as was, this is a fan fiction, Vulcanian enterprises. Modern fan culture was, as you know, probably invented by American housewives who watched a lot of Star Trek uh, in the 60s. And, and all of this stuff was invisible in the mass media 
until the internet and social media made this sort of cult production or folk production connected and it made it visible, and then of course smartphones made it all ubiquitous. So what we forgot in the age of mass media is that not just artists have a need to tell stories. I mean, artists do have a need to tell stories. I think that's why we're all in this industry. But humans have a need to tell stories. All humans have a fundamental and probably biological need to tell stories, to engage with stories and to share experiences. And in fact, now we're realizing with some better historical perspective that even cinema was actually much more like that originally. I love this picture. I've shown it before, so you may have seen it in, in February. This is uh, it's, I stole it from Henry Jenkins, by the way, who wrote Convergence Culture, so it's not my insight. Uh, this is an, an, an early meeting of the Mickey Mouse Club, I think, in the 1930s, in a cinema in uh, the United States. And they're all wearing masks. And at other places in this movie theater, I mean, they were there to watch animation, but, but in other, other places in the movie theater, there could have been crafts demonstrations, for instance, interactive physical things happening. And they might have been, for instance, singing in a sort of karaoke style uh, in the movie theater together. Um, so we, as an industry, are thinking in this old paradigm, and it's not like it's not bad. It's not our fault. We grew up in this. We've internalized this, and these values are really important to to us as an industry. Uh, and we genuinely believed that the value proposition of film was great art made by creative geniuses and that there is restricted access to this art that we can sell in the form of, for instance, movie tickets. And I think that this is, a, is an error of perspective. We like to think that we're super important, but probably a big part of this value proposition was always the experience of going to the movies and talking about the movies afterwards. And that is actually kind of... The work in the center is almost irrelevant to the experience of talking to your husband about the movie you've just seen. Uh, so, at a big data seminar uh, in Cannes at the Marché du Film this year, uh, this lady from Deloitte said a very smart thing. So, they were, they were talking about big data and how do we use big data in the film industry, what kinds of questions do we need to answer, and if we start to mine our audience data or buy audience data externally, how do we, what, how, where should we begin? And she said, you have to start by asking yourself whether your audience has already answered your question. Did they write a blog about it? Did they buy one, a ticket to your movie five times? Then you already have the information. You don't need to go to a very expensive agency and, and mine some data to figure out. If people don't like your movie, like if people don't go and see your movie, it's quite possible that it's because it's terrible or because it, it's not connecting to what they want. And this is what I'm going to be talking about, so I'm sorry it's, it's going to be a little bit traumatic. Um, the core problem for film is that people will not show up to see the films that we release. Or they are not willing to pay for the content that we make. And if that is the case, then the audience has already told us, by not showing up, that much of our product, either the films themselves or the experience of watching the films, or both, is fundamentally not very competitive. So what is the value of film to the audience? And we should care, by the way, about this, because the audience pays for the film. That's not what it feels like when you're a filmmaker, because you think that the financiers pay for your film, or that the taxpayers pay for your film. But that is, that is, only, a, that is only infrastructure. The people who actually pay for your film ultimately is the audience. So... The experience value of film, the audience value of film, the first point up there, person, being personally moved or transported by a piece of art, for instance, the film. That is a communication between the filmmaker and the individual viewer. And that's where basically all of our focus is, except that often we don't even think about the viewer, we just think about our own work and who is going to pay for it. And that's only the first little part. But mostly, all of this other stuff, is, the, is in the green circle, the context of film. And that's, in fact, then when the majority of the value of film is for the audience. So it's these kinds of things, sharing an experience. Uh, it, film can be a cultural moment, or create cultural icons, or be a cultural icon. Establishing role models, so serving a function for society, um, a normative function. Representing and shaping contemporary culture, being a topic of folk or a focus of conversation. Uh, supporting and inspiring subcultural identities and social contexts, including fandom, but not limited to fandom. 
and also film can be um, an area of expertise where you can get some kind of social status by knowing stuff about film. Film is enormously valuable to, to society. Certainly it was in the last century. It's open for debate whether it is now, but it was before. Uh, so for much of the 20th century, knowing about film, being knowledgeable about film, being a film geek, in fact, was a social currency that had worth. The quality of the art is vitally important. What's in the the pink circle is really, really important. It has to be emotionally engaging. That's the beating heart of film culture. And to learn to love a film, you need to have, have films to love. I'm 38 years old, so my generation is probably the last generation where being a film fan or a cineast was a social identity. That's not something you can be today. If you're a film fan, it doesn't mean anything in the way that it meant when I was a kid. I was raised by a film fan on the Marx Brothers and on a culture of going to the cinema. And then my life was changed in the 1990s by filmmakers and by film festival programmers. So again, the experience is just as important. Who, and they changed our life by pointing uh, at this, th saying this thing, these things exist, these wonderful works are made. Look at this, look at uh, Reservoir Dogs or La Enne or La Laurent and all of these, these films made an enormous impact on me and, and affected a generation of, of storytellers. But in an abundance economy, the impact of the individual work is lower. And many of the social functions of film, all of everything green on that previous list, can be filled by other media just as well. So if you're 16 or 26 years old today and you have a sort of the exact same taste as I did, and similar values as I did when I was a kid. What do you see? Would you see? What is the equivalent of these things? I think it's probably something like this. So, so what is blowing minds and what is shaping conversations? It's going to be TV drama and it's going to be computer games. And yes, of course, it's also going to be movies. We can ha that can also have that impact on us, but it's not exclusively movies in that way anymore. In fact, it's marginally, I think, movies. And all of these works are great. But if our cultural conversation pieces are mostly consumed in our living rooms, as these are, uh, or if they're mainstream hit movies, uh, like Inception, then they will not drive us ever to explore film history or to go to a film festival or to become part of film culture. So, at this time, if you got into this stuff, it was like falling into a rabbit hole, and then suddenly you were watching movies from the 50s. In, in, at, in this time, there's no reason for you to go back and explore film history, because that's just not how the social context of film works anymore. And longer works, like TV shows, will drive engagement automatically. You get into a social thing, but they, it also means that you will watch fewer works in total. So if you love Daredevil, you're probably also committed to all of the other Defender shows on Netflix, and that means that takes up the time of like 12 movies, that you're, at least, that you're not going to see this year. So, what's happened to the industry in the last 5 to 15 years is part of a wider historical shift from a hierarchical society centered around nation states to a more networked society where digitalization and globalization enables the kinds of cultural behaviors that people have been wanting to do all the time. And it has led to, as a side effect, the cultural value of film changing. Um, so one thing that comes from this is that there is just no room for mediocre content anymore. Like everything you do has to be good. Those bad movies that Peter was talking about an hour ago, you made a bad movie and it still had 350,000 views at, in the cinema and long life on DVD. That's just not, that's gone. Um, because why would you ever choose to see something bad when so, you have so many good things uh, on offer? But there are also other currencies in the old system that have been devalued, and I'm going to look very briefly at two of them. So one uh, of the old currencies is celebrity. And historically, celebrity was something that was produced and controlled by the entertainment industry. Uh, back in the days of the studio system, this was even literally true. So the bodies and, and visual surfaces of humans were owned and what they were allowed to say in public was owned. And then that isn't as clearly true anymore, but certainly still when I was a kid, we're back to the Mickey Mouse Club again. This is a 90s class of, of the Mickey Mouse Club, and you can see there Britney Spears, Justin Timberlake, Christina Aguilera and Kerry Russell growing up in the Disney system to become the last generation, essentially, of made, created celebrities, controlled celebrities it starts to feel so old-fashioned. There's something about a red carpet premiere that feels so fake today. I still look at those pictures, but even to me, 
even, even to me who's internalized this, because I've been raised on this, it, it feels, I don't get the point ultimately, like it feels too plasticky. And of course, this isn't how celebrity is created today at all. Um, celebrity can be produced in a different way, in a sort of competitive way, in an open, abundant thing where people are creating stuff, and then th that which resonates with an audience grows exponentially, and then those people are picked up. And, and so these are YouTube celebrities, all of them. And YouTube celebrities are not less than. It's not like we have the real celebrities and the real talent and the real TV hosts and so on. And then here we have the sort of poor man's versions because they're amateurs. It's not that you can't take these and, and slot them into the traditional entertainment industry. You absolutely can. And in fact, that is exactly what YouTube is doing now. So, so now there's something called YouTube Red, which is YouTube's subscription service, SVOD service, which they're rolling out in the world. And that comes with a big music service attached. So it's designed to challenge primarily Spotify and, and iTunes, but at the same time, you also get access to their YouTube originals. So this is building a basis for challenging um, uh, Amazon, Netflix, HBO, Hulu as well. And their specialty now where they're starting this rollout for their, is the 18 to 34 audience that none of us can reach, nobody else can reach really. Uh, and they're using their homegrown talent in these uh, shows that are very expensively produced, uh, the equivalent, they don't really as numbers, but that they said that they spend about as the same as what cable television would cost in e each market on these local productions, which are sort of very high value and they make them in, in a bunch of um, different languages. Um, so Alex Carlos is the director of YouTube Originals and, and he said there is a definition of authenticity among millennials that is so much more about genuinity than a shiny floor. So it's a discussion about production values. I think to a lot of us, if, if you're a DP, for instance, it's so insulting that somebody telling stories with a webcam, you know, can have that impact when your stuff doesn't even get seen. But it's not about, it's not always about looking good. Like to this generation, something being real in this environment, in this cultural environment where everything is constructed and fake and mediated, reality or genuinity as perceived by them, by the way, not necessarily truly, but perceived genuinity is so powerful. And recognizability is still key. It's not like, like celebrity is irrelevant for packaging, for instance, or marketing. But we are so hung up on this old idea of celebrity. Like what is a film star? and you want to package your script with a film star so that people will recognize it. I think you're realizing, if you're working in the Swedish market, that the, big, the names, the recognizable names, are like Robert Gustafsson, and he's probably the youngest on that list of the, you know, <laughs> names that will actually drive people to the cinema. This is a big problem for this industry. We cannot rely on this old currency of celebrity. You just have to let that go, or work with the new celebrities. But their skill set isn't designed for what we're trying to do. Then we also have this problem, the other currency was this idea that we create these final works. So we, you have the author, or auteur indeed, who has wit and talent, and the thing that we sell is a complete work of art, and we sell access to that, to being in the presence of a genius storyteller. There was always a fiction, because films were always made by teams of tens or hundreds of people, but we, that idea is still there. Uh, so the work of the audience was to obey and receive. Obey and receive the wit and talent of the geniuses. And that dynamic has completely changed. And I, I'm ashamed that I need to be telling you this, but in my experience, I do need to tell people in the film industry this, even though this has been going on since the 1970s, so I don't know how we as an industry missed it. But could we just do a little raise, sort of checking of hands? How many people in this room play any kind, any kind of computer games? Okay, thank God. I can tell you that at the Marche du Film this year, it was zero. How many of you identify as gamers in some way? Okay, that's much lower, that's very interesting. Um, but that is a group that is much more limited in many ways, okay. So this is a big challenge to us as an industry. Uh, digital games have been around since the 1970s, and analog games uh, were very big in the 80s and 90s as well, so, so, people, so game playing logic is present in, in, in a very wide section of everybody who's my age or younger. In fact, gaming is universal in my age group and down. The only people who are not playing games today on a regular basis are people who have a lot of power in the traditional culture industries. So decision makers, filmmakers, 
are the only people. They are so invested. They grew up invested in these other systems, so they didn't need to care about games because they were very expert in something else. And unfortunately, this makes us blind to this very important thing that has happened, which is this industry is a hundred billion dollar industry globally. That is the exact same size as the global fin film industry. And these games, these works of art or entertainment, usually entertainment, but they're getting there, are consumed on the exact same screens, in even cinemas now because of esports, the exact same screens as everything we make. We can't pretend like this isn't happening. And again, we said the, the, the earthquake is over, so we don't get to do this anymore. We have to just look at it and be like, okay, what's going on? So the two things at least that we have to think about. One, digital games have solved digital sales. They don't have cinemas. They never had cinemas. They had arcades for like five minutes. They're going to audience anyway. Now, how do they do that? I don't have time to go into it in detail, but in short, they have very engaging products, they have strong relationships to their audience, and they figured out digital distribution, thereby effectively killing their privacy problem, which was enormous, until they figured out digital distribution, and then their pri privacy pro problem shrunk to almost zero. The other thing that this means is that everybody who is younger than 38 years old is in fact very comfortable with lean-in, active, participatory art forms. Art works, works where the participant completes the work through their presence and typically also through their engagement. So even Candy Crush, which I think a lot of us play, it's not very complex, but it's still much more engaging than a mid-quality piece of television or film. So, but, but that, and that's a single-player thing. But fundamentally, these games are social activities. Even when you're in your own experience, like these three kids in, a, in VR, they're all looking at their own thing. I took this picture in New York on Sunday uh, at the Future of Storytelling Festival. Um, these kids are probably like four years old. And they're, they're, t telling, they're talking to each other about what they're experiencing. They were sort of narrating uh, what they were seeing all the time. If you've started with VR at four years old, I mean, it's not even, you know, 10 years from now, these kids will be that audience that we find so hard to reach even today. Just think about what it's going to be like to try and reach these uh, kids. So there's a, a theoretical problem here, which is for, for us, for our identity as artists, is that suddenly the participant is the storyteller. We cannot control every aspect. We can't get to decide where their eye goes. Like in, in the movie theater, you sit there and you control their focus through editing and direction and, and, and also physically locking them down in a chair. You, if you can't do that, you have to tell stories in other ways. They're not worse, they're just different. But we, as an industry, are not great at that. And this is a problem because it means that when we make VR films, they're terrible. Um, but it also is a problem because audience expectation is driven, is, con is affected by the, the ways that they consume other kinds of culture. So if you read books and then sometimes you go to the cinema, cinema will be very immersive and very powerful. If you read books and go to the cinema and you also play games on your mobile and you also have VR gear set at home, then the, the relative position of, of movies will have changed. We have a, an enormous need, as an industry and as individuals, to have complete creative control, and, have, and we believe that that is how we control the quality of the work. We have very low trust for the audience, and that's a problem. Uh, and interactive movies is happening now, by the way. I saw some demonstrations. They're not super interesting, but the technology is there. It's even possible to do it so that you watch a film like this, and there's a camera on top of the screen like this, and it reads micro-expressions on your face and then it controls what happens, depending on my emotional reactions. This is technology that exists. It's very interesting. Again, the storytelling, not great, but it's coming. Um, today is the 13th of October, and that means that today is the global release date of Sony's PlayStation VR set. Uh, so, as we have predicted in the Nostradamus report, obviously gaming will be the driver of VR technology into the homes. Um, they can't currently produce any of these sets as far as there is demand for them, so it will take quite long. This is a cheap um, setup, but it still costs about $500, and then you also have to already own a PlayStation 4 to use it. Uh, so it's going to take some time, but, but with some time we mean probably like one or two years. Today on the Steam Store, which is a digital distribution platform for games, if you, if you look at like a VR hit, it probably has literally like 100 users. But very, very soon that number will go like this. Again, most of the VR storytelling today is 
terrible, but it also represents enormous creative op opportunity and it attracts a lot of attention in the film industry, especially for young, younger creators. And I think it is because a lot of younger creators are in fact already grown up in this new world and they, they feel that there is something slightly off with how we make movies. Um, and of course, VR isn't quite there yet, but AR, so augmented reality, where you, where you add digital or, or visual storytelling layers to the real world, is very powerful. So this is just one example. Uh, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, which is a museum or um, a center uh, in, in the US, which has the world's uh, greatest collection of Holocaust testimonies and also witness, um, witness bird. Um, uh, testimony from other genocides. Uh, they are in a situation right now where the last Holocaust survivors, uh, obviously for just chronological reasons, are, are dying. So the question is how can we document, uh, how can we make documentaries that are a sort of true representation of the experience of these people when we don't know what questions people would like to ask them. So they have set up these um, 360 rigs where they have documented, uh, well, they're going to do as many as they have time for, I think, but at this point they've documented 12 Holocaust survivors in this way. This man is called Pincus Gutter. They set them in this, so it's filmmaking, it's documentary filmmaking, but in 360. And they set them in this room and they have them, they sit with them for hundreds of hours and ask them thousands of questions, anything. They get to tell their whole lives and anything they remember, anything that people might want to know. And then they generate uh, holograms from this. And they, of course, also have footage of them listening and responding and saying yes. And then there's speech recognition, uh, and it also knows where you are. So you can sit, and I experienced this in New York this weekend, uh, you can sit and talk with Pincus as a hologram. He will look at you, you can ask him questions, and he understands your English, and he will answer your questions. You can ask him basically anything. And this is not like a, it's not a robot, you see, it's not a generated thing, it's an actual document documentary situation of this man's actual face answering those actual questions. And when documentary is moving in this direction, we, we don't even know what the limits are, but we can't pretend like this won't affect every kind of film storytelling there is. We're still going to have movies and traditional films, but this will also exist. It, this, in fact, also exists. Okay, now let's recap two points. One. The democratization of cultural production and distribution has been terrible for powerful old media institutions like the film industry, but it is great for humans and also for powerful new media conglomerates. And these two don't have the same interests. So humans, of course, like democracy, and companies like monopoly. So right now we're at a tipping point where the question is who gets to control distribution in, in this new world? And of course the path, path of least resistance will yield, us, yield to the biggest platforms. I think that if Google, Netflix, Amazon, Facebook, Sony and Disney will dominate film and TV between them, it will hurt the production landscape and it will be terrible because then you will have a full value chain studio system and it will be very difficult for any of us to, to break in. And that's a question, this is something that might happen. Second point. So film, TV and interactive increasingly overlap. All the new formats uh, meet. We have different behaviors from the users, but they're on the same screens. And they have some things in common. This is a pool market. That means everything is available. What do I want to see now? Why do I want to see this now? How do you make something unmissable? And I'm going to answer that in, uh, in the next like 15 minutes. Um, so to make something un unmissable, you can either shout really loudly, you can make a $250 million movie, and then you throw another $250 million at selling it, uh, and then you end up with Batman v Superman, and good luck with you. Uh, or you can make an irresistibly engaging TV show. That seems to still work. Uh, of course, you don't know until you've made it whether it was actually irresistibly engaging. Or, fundamentally, you can have a relationship with your audience. These are your options. Um, but I'll just remind you again of, of the thing. So we are always so focused on the work, like the shape of the work. But then around it, there is that big context, which is the, the social situation and the consumption situation and the buying decisions and so on. So, so the shape of the, of the work, of the pink area, the film that you're making, certainly there will be some formal changes. Authenticity is valued, complexity is valued, 
uh, the audiences are very comfortable with nonlinear content. Production technologies are changing, uh, and that affects like, animation. Enormous revolution happening in motion capture right now because it's being driven, for instance, by VR and gaming. So all of that's going to be very, very different. But there's also a renaissance in, in hand-drawn, hand hand-drawn looking animation, for instance. So formal things changing. And then we have the green context, which has already changed. And that's what I've been talking about up to now. What is film now? Killing time? Is it big entertainment in the cinema? Sure. Is it a powerful experience in the home? Yeah. Probably if it's something very powerful, you would rather, if it's like a big emotional documentary that's going to stab you in the heart. Many of us choose to see it at home and not in the movie theater because we feel that that intimate space is better for it, but our distribution and our funding doesn't take that into account at all. So we live in a time of, of, of uh, it's difficult to know what's true, and we live in a time of enormous social change. There's no wonder that documentary as a genre is doing really well. Um, and we live with video, online videos. Of course, there's an explosion of short format storytelling, and the number of filmmakers is growing exponentially, and some of them are really talented, and those people don't get connected into the, into the traditional film industry at all. And these are stupid problems that we need to solve really fast. So I put together a bunch of like these buzzwords that we've looked at in the last few years, and you don't need to read them all. But I, but I looked at them, and, and can, is it possible to divide them into categories? Like these are all examples of stuff that we know works. Very different level. You have like hashtags, and you have immersive cinema, like very different levels of things. Uh, but I, I broke it down into five categories. So the first category is everything that's green right now. Making an investment of money or, or, time, or, or time, for me as a, as a consumer. It requires that I need to be aware that your product exists or your work exists, and then it also requires trust. And this, of course, is why known filmmakers are easier sales than first-timers. That's why all of those big brand movies make uh, most of the money. But this is something that you can do. You can choose to ride on an existing relationship to a celebrity, to an influencer, to friends, because Recommendation, of course, is the strongest seller now. Uh, or to a brand, possibly. A brand relationship could be the thing that will make me go and see a film. Two, you can create a special or specific moment. You can introduce either artificial scarcity, so you, you break the abundance logic. Instead of everything being available at all times, it's only available right now. This film plays now, only today, only right now. Um, so, but you can't be like, it can't be like a fake scarcity. So we used to say movies are only possible to see in, in, in cinemas right now, but then because of piracy, that's not actually true anymore. But if you add something, if you add the, uh, a live event to the movie, then that is a thing that happens only at that specific time. Three, you can build a community around your product. So you can actively design the green around the pink. And you can make that a really interesting place to be. So this is not about top-down. This is not about PR where you like hand out branded junk to people. They don't want your junk. This is about engagement and relationships. How can you build relationships around your movie? Everybody who is in documentary, I think, is thinking about this now because it's the only way to get documentaries seen today. Uh, you can enable a deeper engagement with the work itself or around the work. So this could be about VR, it's possible to physically step into the movie, but it could also just be about storytelling craftsmanship and a really powerful voice, or um, enabling those, the, a fandom or a community around your piece. And you think that if you have, you make maybe, a, again, like a, a movie about a really relevant topic, so it should automatically become a, a, top, a subject of conversation in society. That used to be true, but it's not true anymore, because you release something that's really meaningful, and then Donald Trump happens. There was some, I can't remember now which one, somebody had released a, a film or some kind of project, and it was the day before 9-11. Like, so they actually like, they put, took it out and re-released it last year, because... Nobody had heard about it the first time around, and it did quite well. But you can build for this. Uh, you can invest money into activities and frameworks around your piece that uh, allow for deeper engagement. And then finally, the last, <laughs> the last thing is so obvious that it's almost embarrassing to say aloud. Speak to the needs and interests of your audience. It's astonishing that we, as a community of storytellers, are only now realizing this, and it's like a revolutionary thing. You're like, personalizations, targeted screenings, on demand. Like, what? 
What? Like, seriously, I don't know how it, I mean, I know how it's possible, and that's what I've just explained. There are historical reasons for why we didn't. But we, as an industry, have, in fact, not cared very much about what our audience actually wants. They didn't have any choice. So as long as we delivered a good product, it was like fair. Fair's fair. We give them something that's good, and they have no alternative, but it's still good, so everybody gets something out of it, right? That's not how it works anymore. Um, and also diversity, by the way, belongs here, because diversity is so important for, for relevance. So what are the needs and interests of your audience, and who, of those, who are the people who are currently not your audience, and what are their needs and interests? And that's probably what we should ask ourselves. And the way we find that out is through behaviors, because behaviors are expressions of needs and interests. If you just ask people questions, they, don't, they won't know what they would want that doesn't exist yet. So uh, this is the recap. You can pick it back on the relationships, you can create a moment, or you can build a community. That's how you make demand for something that you have made. And the last two are about how to make something that there's already a, a, a demand for, so you can enable engagement or uh, speak to the needs and interests of your audience. And that has to come first, uh, of course. Another way of looking about it, and I spent a few slides on thinking about how do we, how do we reach young audiences. So this is the first that's really important. Young people are not stupid. They don't have bad taste for not liking your work. Like, if your attitude, in your heart of hearts, you would probably never say this out loud, but if in your heart of hearts you're thinking that people are idiots for not seeing your movie, that is a terribly arrogant thing to feel. They're not idiots. They watch terribly complicated TV dramas. They play incredibly complicated games. They navigate very, very complicated media landscapes. And many of these young people have educations and jobs just like us. It's possible to vote and, you know, never have lived in the time of the Soviet Union, for instance. These people are also very, very good at being consumers. They know that they are, in fact, paying for everything we make, and they don't want to be spoken down to. If we feel that people should be grateful to be allowed to see our film, we're way off. And unfortunately, like, I feel about that way about my work. I'm like, I made this thing, and it's kick-ass. And you should be grateful that you get to engage with it. Uh, yes, but I mean, that can't be my strategy. <laughs> That can be my feeling, but that cannot be how I, how I prioritize or fund my work, because that doesn't work anymore. We should be grateful that they want to see our film. So marketing is increasingly irrelevant, and word of mouth, social recommendations, they call it now, which is really funny because it means word of mouth, uh, is, this is vital, because it's about trust. So, of course, I know that advertising is lying to me, because advertising just wants my money, but a friend wants me to be happy, so if a friend says, go see this thing, then it means something. And diversity is, again, key at this. Don't insult your viewers, don't erase viewers, don't ex erase the experiences of your, of your viewers. And that can mean, does your piece in any way reflect the demographic reality of the culture in which you live? If you and your team are all white dudes, you may not be noticing how marginal you are. And that's a, that's a real thing. Like, that is a real worry. And this is not a, a, a justice issue. I mean, it's also a justice issue. I care very passionately about social fairness. But if you don't, it doesn't matter, because this is a business decision. It doesn't matter what your politics are. If there are no brown people in your film, you have made yourself irrelevant. You know, unless, unless, of course there are topics. Yeah, sure, if you make a documentary about like a home for old white guys, then it makes sense. But even so, there might be staff there that's not old white guys. And th how those people are portrayed in your film is very fucking important. Sorry, I'm cursing. Okay, but this is also about the experiences on much more trivial levels. If you're a cable provider and, and your customer service is terrible, that will hurt every film on your platform. So, so in every way, so respect the experience, respect the experience of your audience at all times. So the old paradigm value chain looked something like this. This, this is a timeline from, from left to right. First you ask yourself, what story do I, the filmmaker, want to, make, to tell right now? Then you have to ask yourself the next question very soon, which is what version of the film that I want to make can I get funded right now? Those are not typically the same. So then you figure out what version you can get funded, 
and then you make the version of, film, of the film that you can get funded, and in fact, when your funding kicks in, then it's very urgent, so then you make whatever film it's possible to make at that moment, whether or not that was the film you wanted to make. And then it is the job of somebody else to sell my film to some people who should probably see it. Now, today, con consumers have a very low tolerance for an inflated institutional ego. And the first sign of the institutional ego is that you don't care about the customers, you care about how you look and how you feel. This is what's costing private banking so much, and this is why FIFA is in big trouble. We don't like that anymore. Like, we don't accept arrogance in that way as a society anymore. The car industry is getting caught lying. Like, you cannot be a liar. You can't, you can't manipulate your audience and think that you're going to get away with it, because you don't. The audience isn't even on this slide, and that's a big problem. So now, but this is pretty much how we still all work, and it's not our fault. There's also infrastructure. This is how funding works in Sweden, for instance. But what we need to get is this, and this is still a timeline from left to right, but there are like two things, two steps. And the first step is everything that's happening at the same time in the left panel, which is you ask yourself what stories are interesting and fun and relevant and undertold right now. That's a very important question. Then you also ask what of those stories do I want to tell right now? And very, very importantly, then you ask yourself, is it a film? Because the story that you might want to tell right now might not be a film. In fact, in statistical probability, the, film, the story that you want to tell right now is not a film. A lot of you, especially if you're younger, you've grown up on TV drama. You don't even know how to tell a story in, in an hour and a half, two, and, two hours and a half. You want to be a filmmaker because it's, it's cool. But the stories that you actually want to tell don't even work in that medium, so that is a big problem. That's why you don't get them funded, by the way. Or when you do it, they don't work with the audience. Maybe you want to make a web series, or maybe you want to make a game, or maybe you want to make a film. And if you find out that the story that you need to tell actually needs to be a film, then you need to ask yourself, or this, all of this needs to happen iteratively, that means at the same time in several versions, who is the audience who will pay for my film? And when you can answer all of these questions in a coherent manner, then you can make the film that it is possible, or the work that it is possible to make. And then comes the next step in which digital files are sold through different channels. That's basically how distribution works. Even if it goes to cinema, somebody will, will distribute the digital file, and that's how it works. So when I interview people in sales, distribution, and marketing, they all say the exact same thing. Sales, distribution, and marketing has to work better, smarter, and earlier. Ideally, they all need to come in on script. So you do all of those things, and then you start on the script, and that's probably where sales, distribution, and marketing comes in, because that's when you figure out what is the green around the pink, what is the context of your film, and that will answer the question of how should it be distributed, how is it possible to connect the money of the audience, whether it's coming through taxis or in some other way, with the work that you want to create. This is fantastic, by the way. This is terrifying. Of course, because we're not used to thinking this way. And this does not mean that you have to give up creative control and have some kind of panel of like amateurs who will tell you how to shoot your film. That is not it at all. But it's about figuring out where their interests are and where their money is. And just the fact that you want to tell a story that you find terribly relevant, if nobody else, like if you can convince nobody else of that, you don't necessarily have the right to tell that story with my tax money. You have the right to make it, and you have all of the tools to make it, but you may not need to make it for like 15 million Swedish or 30 million Swedish. Maybe that's the kind of movie that you need to make on your cell phone. That is also a valid way of storytelling, and that might find an audience. And if you know there's an audience, if in your mind when I'm saying this, you become really angry and say, no, there are a lot of people who want to see my film, great. Figure out a way to connect the money of those people or the attention of those people, which is a currency that you can sell to advertisers, to your project, and then you're fine. Like, either it has an audience, in which case it deserves to be seen, or it does not have an audience, in which case, like, maybe the audience is three people, and then the budget should reflect that. Or you're independently wealthy, in which case, like, good, good on you. Um, yeah, so going forward, this presents two separate storytelling challenges, uh, which is just another way to say super enormously exciting storytelling opportunities. And we need to take both of those into, ac into account. So again, this I, don't, I couldn't figure out how to make a round picture in Keynote, I'm sorry. So the inner circle now is the work, 
and the outer circle is the context. So that we have to, we're going to have some changes in the artistic assumptions about the work. Formal questions. Linear storytelling is challenged. So then the question is, when we do tell linear st or one, one path stories in some way, how do we make those as good as possible? Like which, which of those are actually relevant to the audience? Which stories is it still optimal to tell to an audience that's sitting down and receiving, for instance? And does it have to be chronologically linear? No, we know from television and film that it doesn't have to be that at all. Okay, like, so you have to think about that. Um, so nuance differs, differences in strengths between different media. Some films will work, some kinds of stories work really well on television. I, was, I heard Brian Singer speaking in Edinburgh a few weeks ago, Brian Singer, the film director, and he's making television now, he's making a superhero uh, spin, like an X-Men title for television for um, Fox, it's complicated. Anyway, he said that he watched a lot of uh, Aaron Sorkin shows in preparation, and he was thinking he loved The West Wing. And he said, but it's so many, they're just talking, 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 talking. But when you're watching something on a small screen, or even a small screen, talking is pretty good. Like, it's not a visual medium, ultimately. It doesn't matter so much, like, what your direct, directing choices are. He said, television is uh, a, a playwright's medium. It's a writer's medium, just like the theater. And maybe the movie theater is where the big visual stuff happens. Or maybe VR is where it happens. But there are some nuanced differences. If there's a lot of talking in your film, maybe it's not a movie theater film. Maybe it's a television film, and so on. And the second is to consider in a much more profound way than we previously have as an industry the social context of the work and the value of the work to the surrounding society as well as to the consumer. What do we want the film culture of the next few decades to look like and feel like? How do we build the relationships that make film a specific film, but also film in general, meaningful to audiences beyond the moment of watching itself. So when the audience is connecting to the piece, when I'm actually watching your movie, it still works. That's not a question at all. If you make good movies and you get me to watch them and, and they are in any way relevant to me, that is still very powerful. But how do you make that also important? Not just powerful, but also important so that I prioritize that. That is the big question. This is our website. Uh, it's nostradamusproject.org, and we're now going to move directly into the panel discussion. And since we've had a very long, this is a 90-minute session with no break, so I want to say that we're going to move the table and so on if you need to run out to the bathroom or something like that. And also, if you're out of oxygen or your brain is full, it's also okay to leave before we're finished, but try and do it quietly in that case uh, to respect the people who choose to stay. Thank you very much.